basically, this next session will be aiming to complete the perspective and add on from the previous session. Our next group of panelists will be providing their point of view on equity crowdfunding platform and adoption here in Thailand. And it will be monitored by Kun Sarika Apiwatanakun from the Securities and Exchange Commission. She's the director of the Capital Market Promotion Center and has been with the SEC for over 20 years in various capacities. And her main responsibility right now is educating entrepreneurs, providing them with information on how to tap into the capital market, especially in the public listing sphere. So without further ado, may I please invite Kun Sarika to the stage, introduce the panel, the panelists, and kick off the session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the panel session on the stakeholder views on the crowdfund equity crowdfunding and the growth and strategy to the ASEAN Open. Uh, be the moderator today, my name is Sarika Pivatakakun as Kun Pokpong recommend already. Uh, may I introduce our speakers and invite them to join our panel. First, Mr. Shanit Chan Chainarong. Please welcome Mr. Shanit. <laughs> Next, Mr. Jason Xu from Taiwan. <laughs> and Mr. Manoj Chama. Please welcome. He's from Singapore. From the, the yesterday session, if you are in here in the morning session, Kun, uh, uh, in the morning session from two Monday, uh, Kun Punamat, he said that the crowdfunding is quite new for Thailand, and he is very excited and scary in the same time. The sense of the excited because of the crowdfunding, especially the equity crowdfunding, it is. Uh, it is a new way to the entrepreneur to raise funds. And for the scary for them, what did he think? He think about that if we did not get everything in place and do it correct at the first time, we might be get the industry go home. So if we think about what should we do to, the, to make things good, today we have uh, the panelists to give our to give us the chair view on the how we adopt the equity crowdfunding. If we have the open dialogue for, from them and from the floor, we might be do the better for the regulation frameworks. So before we go to the question, let me introduce our our guests. First of all, start for my far left. Mr. Shanit Chan Chainarong. He started working with the SEC. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he started working with the Stock Exchange of Thailand since 2006 as a president of Market for Alternative Investment or MAI to create fundraising opportunity for small and medium capital and the high growth company. Now he is an executive vice president of the Stock Exchange of Thailand. He also served in many important positions in both public and private, such as board member of National Electronic and Computer Technology Center, or we know as NETEC, and the National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA, and the Chamber of Commerce. Next, Mr. Jason Xu. He is the co-founder of the Big Question, an innovation consultancy and focuses on city innovation and data visualization. He also creates the TEDx Taipei Conference and serves as TEDx Ambassador for Asia. In addition, he co-founded and is Chief Catalyst for Mekaba Taipei, a Taiwan leading hardware and software integration incubator. Last but not least, Mr. Manoj Sharma from Singapore. 
He is the board of trustee for the Action Community for Entrepreneur or S. S is a private sector led moving the to for entrepreneur by entrepreneur. The, that helps aspiring entrepreneurs start up by building a wide brand community and connect them to the resource, people, and knowledge. Also, he is very active in the international startup scene as a speaker and judge and delights in mentoring entrepreneurs from around the world. So, it's time. So, uh, let's start our session. For the, as you may know that the regulations for the crowdfunding is arise in many countries in Asia. Before we go to the adoption of equity crowdfunding regulation framework, let me heard some experience from our panelists that uh, in your country, how about the uh, environment of the equity crowdfunding or general crowdfunding? Can you give us the experience in your country? Let's start from Kun Manoj. Thank you. Uh, maybe for everyone's benefit, I'll give you an overarching view of the Singapore entrepreneurship landscape first and then give you a sense as to what we're attempting to do with equity crowdfunding in the country, then things fit into context. Uh, because while we're all part of uh, Asia and ASEAN, the truth of the matter is, uh, the economies are really at different stages and the competitive advantages are different across the board. In 2003, uh, Singapore took an unprecedented step to actually appoint an acting minister for entrepreneurship. Now, that says a lot because it tells you that while the economy was very much dependent upon multinationals, in an attempt to catalyze the SME marketplace, they recognized about 10 years ago that this was not a sustainable model. Uh, the effort, because they put a minister in charge of it, obviously the entire attempt to catalyze the entrepreneurship landscape was government-led. Uh, they recognized the fact that uh, while private enterprises uh, can work in a free market, there's a lot when it comes to regulation that government needs to be able to do. Uh, the mentality, and I've been hearing this over the last couple of days here, uh, has been such that uh, people uh, in, I think, um, uh, Mr. Best, where is he? Uh, yeah, Jason's outside, okay. So he was saying, you know, even in the US, there's a problem in relation to uh, getting entrepreneurs to want to be entrepreneurs, because the mentality is, why would I want to be an entrepreneur? And I think it's similar for Thailand, and definitely was like that for Singapore. But the truth is, 10 years later, it's gotten to a point, initially people don't want to be entrepreneurs. Now, in, uh, when people are in the first year in university, they don't want to go out and get a job, they want to be entrepreneurs. So what has actually happened? Uh, government spending for uh, pre-seed or seed money, the entire funding mechanism is so lucrative that it is worthwhile for somebody to forego a job and just go directly into the startup. So having said that, uh, just to give you a little bit of sense of mechanism and then where does equity funding come into it. A startup in Singapore can get seed funding of 50 to 100K just on an idea. Now it's not free money, uh, it's a co-shared mechanism uh, in which the startup puts in 30%, government puts in 70%. So that's the first tier, 50 to 100K. We have a technology incubation, we have an iGEM scheme in which a startup that's involved with the media development can get 250K Singapore dollars. No need to put a cent in. We've got a next level of a government-driven scheme working together with VCs in which uh, it's called a technology incubation scheme in which uh, there's a co-funding mechanism. The VC puts in about 15, 20%. Government tops up the other 85 to uh, 80%, which means they can get about 750K to take the startup to the next stage. Then, of course, there's the open market mechanism. So when it comes to uh, equity crowdfunding, it will not be in Singapore's context at a micro level. Most likely, it will be somewhere within the vicinity of how do I raise a mil, a mil and a half to three and a half to five mil. And that's really the gap in which it, it will fit in. So right now, what's happening in Singapore is SGX, as many of you may be aware, has made an announcement to, together with a Clearbridge Accelerator to actually create an equity funding platform, but they haven't announced the details of it yet. Uh, but the, the level at which it's going to be played, I guess it's going to be at a different level. 
from a lot of the other mechanisms that we see, for example, in Australia. So with that, I've said enough and taken enough time. Uh, I'll pass it on first. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm actually here to wear uh, a few different hats uh, besides the uh, organizers for Telex Taipei. Um, I'm also the co-founder for a makerspace uh, called Maker Bar. And, and it is actually to tap into the hardware and man manufacturing capability of Taiwan's high-tech industry. And the funny thing is, we, when we started about 18 months ago, uh, nobody cared about makers. And 18 months later, you've seen big companies like Foxconn, Quanta, HTC, uh, Asus, they all come to us and they say, how can we work with you? How can we work with uh, a makerspace like you guys to do accelerate, accelerator projects? Um, so that's you know, one of the interesting things that there are more and more maker-like projects getting into crowdfunding scene. Um, and the situation in Taiwan is quite different. Um, the crowdfunding wasn't popular until maybe uh, 12 months ago when we had a huge student protest uh, in Taiwan. It was to protest a under table deal with, uh, um, with China on the free trade agreement. And the students, thousands of them took to the streets and occupied the uh, legislator hall and um, basically took over the legislator hall for 45 days. Um, and there was a crowdfunding project that raised over uh, two million US dollars to advertise a uh, front page ad on the New York Times. Um, and it was very impressive. Um, and after that, you've seen a lot more crowdfunding platforms um, happening in Taiwan. Right now, as we speak, we have 16 crowdfunding platforms in Taiwan. And you've seen uh, big public companies are now getting into this crowdfunding space, vertical crowdfunding space. Foxconn has uh, what I call kick to real. It's, it's separate vertical crowdfunding uh, channel that accept projects that they will produce uh, products less than uh, 1,000 um, pieces for you. But then you have to basically be owned by Foxconn. And then there are several others in the gaming space and there's several others in uh, content business in, in crowdfunding. And in terms of government, uh, right now uh, the governing body of crowdfunding is uh, OTC, uh, over, over the counter um, this, um, security agency. And we've now announced a um, uh, equity crowdfunding in a very restri restricted way. And we are now still experimenting whether it makes sense for uh, some of the projects to do equity crowdfunding, but we haven't really seen anyone that's really happening right now. Uh, mostly just reward-based or uh, incentive-based uh, crowdfunding. But I foresee this will happen uh, in the next uh, uh, six to 12 months time. First, let's congratulate our regulator, my bosses, uh, the SEC for taking up this initiative because this is a very difficult, um, sometimes uh, questionable, because let me give you some example from my many, many um, years experience working with entrepreneur. I was formerly uh, one of the fund managers doing venture capitalist years ago before I was recruited here to work for the uh, Stock Exchange of Thailand. Actually, the 15 years ago, the Stock Exchange of Thailand this year reached 40 years, 4-0. So we are 40 years old. You know, 15 years ago, they were talking about having a market for SME, for small, medium size. It was a lot of, we had a lot of doubt. Uh, many people doubt whether it will fly, whether it will work. You know, it's proven 15 years that there are plenty of entrepreneurship in each country. Of course, 15 years ago, everybody in this region were looking into the different model, whether they should follow the US, the NASDAQ. <clears throat> which is full of innovation with all many of the high-tech companies. Or they can follow the London model, which is the AIMS, the um, alternative investment market. 
So from the Thai perspective, we took the middle road, you know, not taking one or the others, but we actually um, follow the name from AIM in London. So we use it MAI. It's a market for alternative investment. So that was the only close to copy and development. <laughs> but you know, I, 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 had, I worked with my three previous presidents before I became the fourth of the market. The first five years, now I have to look at my numbers. I've been scribbling the numbers for you. The first five years are the most difficult part. We raised, the market raised less than 175 million US dollars in the first five years of inception. There was no trading, hardly less than three million US dollars when I, when I started work per day of liquidity. Why Singapore has their SESDAC, Malaysia has their MESDAC. But we, we re-strategize our thinking. So the next 10 years, the last 10 years, the market actually grew over 10 times in terms of fundraise. Last year itself, we raised about 600 million US dollars plus, last year alone, for the small and medium-sized company. Half of it's for IPO, the other half for the secondary offering. But the total, the last, um, the first five years, 175 million. The next 10 years was 1.7 billion in terms of fundraise. So in terms of the ecosystem for the Thai market, and this is for our guests from abroad, such that you understand where the SEC are thinking, where the regulators are thinking, where we are coming from. Because we have now a working model for small and medium-sized company. The exit is there. Um, my current president, Kun Prapan, will enjoy more than 20 IPOs from now on each year. Last year, the whole market had about 46 IPO. I think we rank, we, we, we are number one in ASEAN for the last two years in terms of fundraise for the exchange level, both in terms of the main board and for the second board. But to give you an idea that it took a lot of hard work to convince entrepreneur to understand corporate governance, to, under, to understand proper accounting. Oh my God, we had our fair share for fraud. I, I can't admit to it, because the early years of the MAI, we were hit by a big fraud case. We have to turn around the whole thing before we get investor confidence to come back. Nowadays, our trading per day is close to 200 million US dollars a day. We are now about 10% of the main board. Our the whole exchange trade about 1.3 billion US a day. Now, that's more than Singapore and, and, and Malaysia combined. Okay? I can say that because I think the last two, three years, we overtook Singapore for the, we almost twice Singapore in terms of the liquidity per day. But that's besides the point, but that's the ecosystem where we are coming from. So entrepreneurs in Thailand understand the exit mechanism we had over hundreds of companies preparing to go on to the second board, which is the MAI. Not to, not to talk about the main board itself, but we have provinces. The SEC has been working very hard to promote capital market through entrepreneurship with the people up country, not only in Bangkok. So today is in terms of what we are going to be discussed. I really appreciate this, this whole project. It's going to be a give and take because of the, you know, we are paranoid. I am paranoid. Regulator is always paranoid. Always. It's, oh, I can't, I can't say not always. I can't say not always. The SG is not say, oh, not always. But we are paranoid. I am going to be, as, as always say, paranoid because we went through the experience of the early cases. So how are we going to manage and regulate? But believe me, we have potential. Because I, as my numbers have shown you, the market itself, the capital market itself, are able to absorb any funding request as long as the corporate governance, the accounting, and the proper practice is there. And it's not the same as Singapore and Malaysia. Because our good friends in Singapore and Malaysia apparently realize that they can't follow NASDAQ. So they changed the name of the exchange, the second board. Singapore changed it to Catalyst. Uh, Malaysia changed it to ACE. But we have stayed stay put because our business model has always support the entrepreneurship and the SME. Nothing to do with innovation or nothing to do with other healthcare.
but it's straightforward entrepreneurship. Thank you, Kap. Thank you, Kunshanit. Uh, I heard that uh, in Taiwan, it also have the process to incubate the entrepreneur to be incubate them in the Getai or the Giza. Can Jason share me? Yeah. So um, my uh, my other title is um, this is also happened after a student protest. Uh, the government or the prime minister's office put together a youth advisory group to for the for the um, government to really have a conduit to communicate with young entrepreneurs. So I'm on the committee of uh, the um, advisory group to the premier of Republic of China, Taiwan, and I'm in charge of the uh, innov innovation and uh, uh, education um, uh, projects. Um, one of the things that we are uh, working on is called Taiwan Head Start uh, Project. And it's a project directly under the supervision of National Development Council. And it is to lift uh, all the um, uh, regulations that are concerned with uh, technical shares, uh, IPO uh, restric restriction, and uh, founder share, and uh, all those things that will um, hinder entrepreneurs to s go IPO or set up companies in Taiwan. And we also just announced a innovative visa program, which will allow people with uh, certain skill sets, for example, coding, design, uh, biotech, to spend uh, six uh, to 12 months in Taiwan with a uh, very good visa condition and with a with a really um, beneficial treatments if you want to set up and open an office uh, in Taiwan and recently we've just concluded a uh, the bid to set up uh, what we call a Taiwan innovation stadium it was a uh, old uh, football stadium located in the north of Taipei, uh, and we are now turning the stadium into a national um, incubator. And the stadium, uh, we, the space we use is for the bleachers, the, the rooms beneath the bleachers. So there's about uh, 9,000 pin, will be uh, uh, 27,000 square meters. And uh, it's open up for um, um, international entrepreneurs, including the ones in ASEAN countries, especially in um, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore. We all look forward to working with you guys, and uh, we will establish um, exchange programs, and we will be able to set up interesting uh, programs that we could do exchange and then uh, create some of the uh, cool products together. So um, I'm very happy that if any of you is interested in checking out our program, um, check out Taiwan Head Start, Head as H-E-A-D, -E -E Head Start pro program, and um, I look forward to working with you all. So is this one way to help start up the grow? And I heard from the Singapore, there are also S, that is the, uh, the government, the entrepreneur led for help the startup to grow also. Can you share about how it works? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, Singapore really did not have an entrepreneur culture. Why would you want to be an entrepreneur uh, when multinationals are taking 99% of people out of universities and giving them really great jobs and really great perks? Uh, so that was totally missing. Uh, before I, I touch a little bit further, I think it's become quite obvious. I think. Thailand SMEs of a different kettle of, of fish. I think the entire uh, depth and breadth of the SMEs, again, is very different from Singapore. Okay? Uh, Singapore SMEs, I, I would dare say, would be in some sort of a, a yearly comfort zone without necessarily a desire to grow or to innovate more in terms of uh, self-sustaining. So with that in mind, uh, there was a little bit of a, a gap there. They couldn't count on the SME market. And by the way, there are endless grants to assist SMEs who are, who are already you know, doing $10 million, $20 million in terms of uh, annual revenue in an attempt to take them to the stock market. 
And here's the reality of the situation. Even though the government is providing the grants, the corporate governance, getting them up to speed, a lot of them simply don't want to go to a stock market. So go figure, okay? So with that particular reality as a background, uh, they needed to catalyze the, the landscape. So one of the things we did is we actually had an experiment. Uh, some Many of you would know of this ex particular experiment. We took one of the universities, the National University of Singapore. Uh, we gave them a low-cost building, uh, worked together with the Jurong Town Corporation, who are basically the developers in the country, uh, gave them an opportunity to set up what today is called Block 71. The idea was this, to use the university as an incubator, use the government funding, put startups, put funders, uh, put regulators, put corporate governance, put a whole bunch of people into one particular block and see what happens. Okay? In other words, we created a mini Silicon Valley. Uh, that particular experiment has turned out so well, uh, has been so viable as an experiment, we've now created an entire physical location that we're calling JTC Launchpad. Uh, JTC being Jurong Town Corporation, they did the building, and ACE is the body that's the software for that hardware. Uh, so the, the purpose of ACE now is this, is to, I think there's endless series of grants and schemes, but if you ask a government official in Singapore to articulate all the different grants and schemes and things a startup can tap into, they will struggle to tell you. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I've actually got a chart uh, on my laptop with all these mechanisms. So, but no one can figure it out. But the bottom line is this, there's endless ability to get uh, money. So ACE's role right now is to really facilitate and bring together the whole local ecosystem into one particular physical space. To use that as the basis to interact or assist these particular startups to grow globally. Uh, we've already established a little bit of a brand. I guess 10 years of putting a lot of money and effort and time into it helps you do that. Uh, a lot of global startups, we're now trying to figure out how to get them to use Singapore as their launch pad too. And ACE's entire role is to facilitate and support this entire ecosystem to function uh, without any collusion, uh, without any favoritism, uh, making sure that uh, money is actually being used in a proper channel and a proper way. Um, we have extended to, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the World Entrepreneurship Forum. Uh, some of you would be. Uh, ACE is actually the founding member for the World Entrepreneurship Forum. Uh, together with uh, M. Leon from uh, France and um, Zhejiang University from Hangzhou, which is actually the most entrepreneurial city in China. So um, we're really assisting the local startups go from, I don't want to be an entrepreneur to, I want to be an entrepreneur, to getting them to really have the, mind, the proper mindsets and the skill sets and the business sets to complement it, uh, to making sure the entire local ecosystem comes in as a very tight package and then how to assist to globalize and become a facilitation point for this globalization as well. Now, I'm very excited, uh, just, uh, just on a note, about um, uh, Thailand. And if you don't mind, I'll give you a little bit of a, a little personal anecdote. Um, I used to run a dot-com uh, startup in 1998, 1999. Uh, the name of the company was called eGuide. All we were doing in today's terms, and I was telling one of the startups yesterday, uh, it's such a simple business model, but back then it was very difficult for people to understand. We were taking the yellow pages and putting the yellow pages online. Okay? Uh, the yellow pages in Singapore is a $250 million annual business. We were very early disruptors. We weren't just disrupting that. We then figured out the yellow pages in the different countries around South Asia don't talk to each other. What does that mean? The nature of the franchise war, the licensing was, a yellow pages was put together with a telco and they were run individually, they were not interactive. So we started to take Thai directories, put them online, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and allowed, it, allowed people to source across the board. Now while we were doing that, we set up an office here in Bangkok. Okay. Now this is where it gets very interesting. I'm head of uh, Group Business Development Director and also Product Development Director. I have a technology team in Singapore, about 30 people working to build this. When we set up in Bangkok 15 years ago, we also built a technology team here. And this was where the chaos started. The technology team in Bangkok was outperforming the technology team back in Singapore. Okay? Now, I don't know whether this catches people by surprise at all. The, the, the quality of uh, technologists here was actually greater to a, to a particular point 
uh, it obviously created chaos because more product development is taking place here. So the talent pool 15 years ago was already there. Uh, I have not been in Bangkok uh, in a working capacity for 15 years. I expected on this particular trip back here to see the startup ecosystem to be at a whole different level. It's not at the level that it potentially could be. Uh, but that's perfectly fine. But I think now we're at a particular point, and uh, going back to um, equ uh, equity crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding to me uh, is actually a long tail effect. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this terminology. Uh, Mark Anderson wrote a book maybe, well, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever it was, talking about a long tail effect. So what's a long tail effect for those who don't know it? If you go online, there are a lot of people looking for Britney Spears and Lady Gaga. Okay? There are less people out there looking for Bob Dylan music, music and then very few people looking for artists like Leonard Cohen, okay? which most of you wouldn't even have heard of, I guess, but it illustrates a point. The, long, the internet basically allowed for this long tail effect for every particular group to find what they were looking for and there's a community in there. And I think this is what's going to happen with crowdfunding and equity funding. And then Thailand needs to strategize its role in relation to it. Um, different businesses are going to take a look. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of money out there in the ecosystem. Political reasons, okay, in Singapore as well. And it's shifting the nature of regulation. Uh, political parties in Singapore are not allowed to raise more than $5,000 from a particular contributor. But what if everybody just gives $5? So this, this is, I'm hearing rumors in the, in, the, in, the, in the mill. Apparently somebody's on the verge of raising close to a $5 million war chest to run for political office in Singapore without violating regulation. Okay. So he will choose his mechanisms. And it's the same for startups of different skills, different sizes, different uh, avenues. Uh, there are so many crowdfunding platforms out there. Uh, there are going to be a lot of equity funding platforms out there, and each will ultimately need to be able to serve a particular niche. Then as far as uh, Thai startups go, and I was very impressed with those two gentlemen who happened to be sitting by the side uh, together over there. I sat with them till about 10 o'clock last night just to understand how they think. Then you decide how you want to corporatize your businesses. Do you want to raise funding? Where do you want to raise it? Where do you want to put your headquarters of your startup? Maybe you want to put your back end in Chiang Mai? In relation to it, it's the democratization of capital that we're looking at. And I think it's a very exciting uh, arena. So even though Singapore may have a little bit more of a head start, there are a lot of competitive disadvantages as well that we have. And we recognize that too. Um, and I think you don't need to read between the lines. I'll state it very, very clearly. We're definitely looking. We think partnerships are very, very important. Um, and Thailand could potentially be um, a very strong partner. So we need to figure out how to work in synergy for a much stronger South Asia, at least. I hope that uh, adds some value to the, to the conversation. Yes, can Chanit have something to add? Um, I think one thing I learned is that we, we all can import and export the, the, the concepts because this is all in the global Especially, I'm very glad that we export our yellow shirts to Taiwan now, not only to Malaysia and to the others. So for those of us who doesn't know, but that's part of the, the crowdfunding protest uh, mechanism we have done very well many, many years. And, 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 and for political parties, that could be another source of something we can import for the next election, where we're going to do. But from the, from the exchange point of view, I mean, I... We, one of the job is I see a lot of entrepreneurs who came and exit on the exchange. They get both wealth and they get both growth. I mean, um, when I started out nine years ago, the market size was less than 500 million US dollar with less than 30 companies, 30, about 35 companies listed on. Now, for those companies, including those who went on to the main board, about 140, 130, 40 companies now. And the wealth, it's over 17 billion. So the wealth is there. The, the ecosystem for us is there to help entrepreneurs achieve the, the growth in terms of both fundraise and in terms of wealth create. It's the early part that is still missing. We attempt an OTC market maybe 20 plus years ago. Okay, that OTC market failed, 
And so we had the market for the second board became the, the, the natural after the OTC used to be called Bangkok Exchange or something, I can't remember. But we attempted that before. So for us, in terms from the, from the capital market point of view, it's, it's there. Why? Because the pool of entrepreneurship is there. Okay? Not necessarily internet and dot com. It's come from every business out there. Right now, when you come to equity crowdfunding, how the ties, we can put that as a path and tools, but for allow, but we should allow every other business model, because that's what Thailand is full of, agriculture. I mean, we listed a spa last year for the first time. It took me 20 years to, you know, 10 years to convince that this is a good business model because of healthcare. Because we have many new business models that we listed on last year, the last few years. And that's the, the game, is that once we have the first mover, others, because we are known for our healthcare and our services, so with the first spa we listed on the exchange last year, now others are more interested on. You know, beauty clinics, you should see this. I mean, this is why Thailand is full of beauty clinics. And I hope to see more of those coming on board. So, but the concept of, for the early stage, it's beautiful. It's just how we're going to put it up and running. It's still going to be an issue. Why? Because I always remind people that the, right now when I enjoy the, the growth of the market, the wealth, the liquidity, but let's turn back 13 years ago when we had this internet company, I'm not going to name it, but we all going to have, we, we will all suffer with the, with the fraud that happens. So how are we going to govern that? So for investors especially who are going to be participating in the equity crowdfunding, do they need to be protected? Or we should just let a free for all in the Cowboys, Texas Day, you know, everybody can do that. So we had our lesson, so it's the balance between the two. But believe me, we have potentials, we have pools of entrepreneurship in Thailand. Okay? I was joking that either we don't do this, they're going to go outside, so we have to do it. But how? It's the key. Yes. So from three panelists, exclusive, uh, we said that uh, we now we are ready for the equity crowdfunding, like the environment, the ecosystem. Even in Thailand, we have a pool of entrepreneurship enough for going forward to the equity crowdfunding. But uh, what do you think that? the key success to do the equity crowdfunding in, in your aspect. Can we start with Kun Jason or Kun Chunit? Uh, earlier, in, before the break, the comment from one of the uh, moderator was, shall we try it and then we regulate it? Uh, it's, it's, and if I take up my hat, I say yes. But if I put them on my hat, say, oh, be careful. I don't want to clean up the mess. I don't like, I don't like clean, because we, I cleaned up the mess before. So I had that paranoia in me. Because it took us many years before we can get investor confidence. Because it's long term. You need this to be long term. I mean, if you understand finance, the price earning ratio when I took over the market was six times. Now, Kun Prapan is enjoying his 50 plus times price earning ratios. And the IPO was, um, the, when the companies go on the IPO market, they can get 15 to 20 times price earning. For us, that's enough. For the Thai market, for entrepreneur, this is not high tech. So for me, it's a balance between the two. If you ask me, it's a beautiful concept. We should do it. But how do we help company to actually properly do it. That's the key word. Thailand has experimented with venture capital funds for the last 10, 15 years. I sat on most of the board. You see them fail along the way. We are starting it again, a 20 billion baht private equity trust for venture capital. But this time, I think we learned the lesson of not allowing government agency to do it on their own. We copy the Singapore. It's a fun of fun. You co-match. You, and you let the, the, the fund managers manage. We only put the money in. So we are now relearning the whole concept. 
So the money flow will be going back into the entrepreneurship. But you know, Thailand is full of entrepreneurs. They've been working their way up without using government's help. And I see most of my companies who are, went on the market, they're all family business entrepreneurship. They have raised, you know, last year, 20 billion baht. So that 10, 10 billion baht alone come from the IPO. The market is their investor confidence is they are willing to, to put in at 15, 15 times PE. So this is where the, for, for many of you who are the investor itself, I mean, I welcome you to use Thai market as your exit. You don't need to go to other country. Okay? We offer both uh, breadth and depth for the market, for, your, for the exit. And uh, hopefully in about two weeks time, I will get my uh, wish, my dream for the first ever pr um, foreign listing uh, regulations to come out. That means we will now able to do whatever Singapore has been doing. Um, but I won't do China as my first one. I will do something else. But I would allow to do uh, foreign companies to list on the Thai market for the first time. So hopefully, uh, two weeks, huh? well, somebody told me two weeks time or something. So I don't know, uh, Dan told me two weeks or something. So that would be something for, for us. So investors in Thailand will have more choice to invest. And that's why many of you who are investing in the early stage or they are in the middle stage, please take a look at the Thai market as your exit. Thank you, Kap. <laughs> Kunjani said that uh, if the regulation is in place, so we can make it happen and make it strong and be trust. Uh, for the idea from Kun Jason, uh, what should you think that the key success for the equity crowdfunding? Yeah, I think the issue that we are facing in Taiwan are, are twofold. One is the uh, market constraints and, and regulation, outdated uh, reg uh, regulations um, and as the, the the second issue is obviously the most important one is the trust um, our our government has experimented a uh, semi equity crowdfunding mechanism that you can actually um, uh, this it's not a second board but it's something we call a innovation board on the stock exchange and this is actually allowed early stage startups to raise um, early stage seed fund from the public. But the, the funny thing is they only allow you or the general public to invest um, $2,000, 2000 US dollars the maximum. And imagine you're a founder, you're an entrepreneur and you want to go on this innovation board and you all of a sudden you have 2,000 shareholders who each invest in 2,000 US dollars. It creates a host of problems and it's just not feasible. And the company I am running, I've been, the OTC have been talking to me, trying to get my company on the innovation board, but it was greatly denounced by startup community as not in favor of the current practice. Um, so the equity crowdfunding, um, practice has been moved uh, evolved into somewhat gray area and I think government is trying to understand what's the best way to move forward and this another issue I mentioned earlier is the market constraints and regulations um, the National Development Council that I am working closely with one of our objectives is to invite uh, international uh, venture capital partners to become our uh, uh, LP to really co-invest on a national development fund. So say if a, a Thai national fund co-invest in Taiwan um, um, national development fund and we will match and create a very good beneficial um, uh, exchange package. And that is for Taiwan entrepreneurs to go global. Uh, our objective is now for them to stay in Taiwan because the market size is too small. It is for us, for them to push them to ASEAN, push them to Silicon Valley, push them to uh, New York Stock Exchange. So now we have linked up with um, 20 VCs um, from 
um, Silicon Valley, including Y Combinator, uh, 500 startups, and uh, uh, Sequoia to become the uh, LPs, limited partners for um, Taiwan National Development Fund. And we are also looking actively uh, uh, for uh, VCs to get involved from Southeast Asia and to really help entrepreneurs from Taiwan to go global. And the most of our entrepreneurs' vision somewhat is locked on China, but I believe that Southeast Asia is really the future of the market. And China has its own games and practices, and somewhat it doesn't, does not comply with what's going on outside. And most of them, they, you know, they copy, you know, what's, whatever is out there, they just copy really fast. So I've always encouraged my fellow entrepreneurs to say, think about Southeast Asia and think about the, the market penetration, you know, and uh, the population of Thailand and uh, uh, Indonesia. I think it's a huge market. So one of our drivers for going forward is to really how to get our entrepreneurs to look at into this, uh, market in the Southeast Asia. I just want to add more one thing. There was an earlier question on the before the T about the the registered capitals of the the, the portal, whatever. Now, from the exchange point of view, in my own opinion, I I want to add on on top of that is that I I if no one else does it, maybe we'll, we'll probably forced to do it for the stock exchange point. But if I have ten of you doing it. Uh, it, it makes my life even easier to get more listing because eventually you will, I will have to exit on, my, on, the, on the exchange anyway. So it's, so it's a balance between the two, how we put the requirement of those operators of the funding portal. Of course, it's the, it's the game, you know, you invest in 10, maybe two will be exit on the, on the, on the main board, the other eight will go do their own M&A or whatever. But from, from the exchange point of view, I mean, right now, um, the, for the SME itself, we get at least over hundreds are preparing to go on, to, on the exchange in the next two, three years anyway. So that's not an issue. But of course, we would love to have more potentials. And yes, the crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding portal, it's our best way to identify this. So I, that's why we are coming from. But in terms of the, the size, you know, 100 million people, um, during the break, people were you know, very bitching at me about why so much. And I say, why not? I mean, that's the, to ensure that you are properly, because as Jason mentioned, you know, 2,000 shareholders will create a lot of cost and a lot of headaches. So how would the, the po people who operate Portal would be able to facilitate that as well? Just want to add on, because I just, when I heard men, Jason mentioned. Uh, maybe I just dovetail some of that because I think it's a very interesting uh, area we've gone into. Um, I want to just start off with an analogy first, if I can, because of this, this whole conversation about regulate or don't regulate. Uh, one of our former ambassadors to the United Nations gave an analogy. He says many countries in the world are like aircraft carriers. They're sailing out there into deep oceans. If the waves and the winds change, they'll survive it. Uh, Singapore, and I guess you can extrapolate some of the, the larger uh, the other Asian economies, are like small little sailboats out there in the ocean. If these winds change, the repercussions could be quite fatal in that particular regard. So Singapore is definitely in that particular category. Um, we're going to have, as an absolute certainty, a whole bunch of uh, equity funding platforms that are going to turn up. Um, I've got business plans of three with me. Um, They've been sent over for me to take a look through and give my, my two cents worth. Uh, one is a telco, which has licensed a crowdfunding platform, which the moment the regulations are announced will attempt to uh, move into that particular space in what can only be described as the most desperate and confused way. They've got no idea how to get this done. Okay? Uh, second is, and this really shows you about this, this long tail effect, it is equity crowdfunding specifically for SMEs. They've gone past the whole idea of doing it for startups, and they're specifically targeting SMEs. Uh, the third is, of course, in the public domain. Uh, it's a partnership with uh, SGX, uh, the Singapore Exchange, in which SGX will actually license the platform. 
Now that gives a huge advantage, okay? Uh, because you've got a lot of checks and balances and a lot of mechanisms already in there that you don't necessarily need to be able to build. All three, and if there were 30 in there, they will all function in their own way. So you take a look at Cedar, for example. It allows people as low as $10, $10 for them to be able to invest. Then they've got a whole bunch of hybrid models, right? A creditor and investor puts in X percent, whatever the percentage is, and then you, you follow suit. You're going to see uh, quite a lot of variation, but in the context of, so credibility becomes an issue. So obviously the, the, the platform that partners with SGX, they have to take a stance of regulate first, make sure confidence is maintained, and then down the road, if there's a good crowd checks and balance, ease off the restraint, so to speak. So the combination is likely to be, in that particular context, something along the lines of, I mean, a registration body, ACRA in Singapore's context, in which you've actually got to register your company. Uh, some kind of a credit agency that takes a look at a bunch of details, and possibly a, a neutral party Someone like ACE, for example, who while funded by government for a particular term, is actually privately led and is in non-competition with everybody in the ecosystem to provide some kind of accreditation or authentication mechanism. So there's going to be a whole bunch of models in between. Uh, but maybe the initial stance, if you're a smaller uh, economy or venture, is to err on the side of regulation and then slowly ease things up um, as the market shows its maturity. Yeah. Like Manoj said that uh, you should, uh, we should regulate it first and sometimes we have an uh, accredited investor to involve first. Uh, as the session, the morning session, they discussed that if an invest, accredited, accredited investor they involve and it is not crowd anymore. And what do you think about this? Um, I wasn't here for the morning session, so I apologize for that. Um, I don't think if a accredited investor is involved, it's not crowd anymore. I think there are going to be a variety of hybrid models, and people are going to choose the sort of models that they're most comfortable with. Um, a accredited investor could have lent a lot of credibility to it, could of course sway everybody's thought process in relation to it, but uh, I guess the market will speak over time. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm curious to to understand, you know, if say uh, you're a traditional VC, and all of a sudden you you see a lot of uh, uh, projects that are being funded through equity crowdfunding, and uh, what what would that entail as, you know, uh, someone who's investing, you know, as an institutional investors, and uh, uh, I've, you know, back home in Taiwan, I've talked to. Uh, banks who are just investing for the sake of um, really uh, getting a return. And now they are talking about putting aside a equity crowdfunding fund and just to kind of dump it out there like they were angel investments and then just so that they can have presence in every single crowdfunding project out there. And I wonder if it's, it's a deal flow that they were or deal sourcing that they are trying to trying to do because that's an incredible small amount of those of amount of money that they were they were uh, uh, giving away, but I think the, it's it's like a, um, a, a double edged sword. I think uh, as a as a founder and an entrepreneur, I think I would be very cautious in thinking and and evaluating whether my company should go into equity crowdfunding. And, and I think um, I've tr um, back home I've talked to a few um, uh, entrepreneur friends who've done the so-called 2,000 US dollar um, semi-equity crowdfunding and they've met with a host of troubles. And, and uh, I, I think that this practice still remains to be um, evaluated. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what your take is in terms of regulate first and how do we ensure, you know, what if we just raised from capital markets, you know, from traditional VC, if I have already have a very, 
solid projects why even go into equity crowdfunding? I think it's back to the basics for me. I mean, tomorrow, I think Thursday, we are doing our annual business plan competitions co-sponsored with one of the Chulalong Kwan University, Sasin. We've been doing this for 12 years. This is a global uh, His Majesty's Trophy. Global business plan competitions and the exchange sponsors ex uh, global competition, whether it's Moot Corp, the old Moot Corp, and even social venture, it's back to basics. It's business plan. If it, you get good business plan, you have the right person. A VC will buy, will, will do it anytime. There are plenty of liquidities out there. I mean, imagine the wealth I just mentioned. This 17 billion wealth that was created, 400 or so family, small SME family, listed on the second board alone. This wealth was created. They have plenty of reinvestment that they can do. Not to mention the the 14 trillion baht worth of the, the main board. And 80% of that is private. The, the exchange in Thailand is not the same as in other country, where half of it or a third of it is government related or state owned enterprise. We are 80% private entrepreneur families. So there are many, plenty of families with monies out there that can invest. I think it's the project itself. That's why when you go to equity crowdfunding, uh, as it looks good, it looks nice. Imagine the administrative that goes on. I mean, we run the exchange, we understand how tedious clearing settlement registrations, settlement, all those stuff can be very costly. But of course, we make money from our trading because of the 1.4, 1.3 billion US dollar turnover per day. Of course, that's where we make our money. But I don't think our equity crowdfunding would allow aftermarket liquidity. It's a one time. So the business model has to be there. For me, I still haven't figured out because I came from the, from the oldies where the VCs invest, we bring the, the companies, teach them, nurture them, grow them. Half of them fail, the other half is good, the other half you have to really grow them such that they can get the exit out. So that is still the old traditional. But now with the new um, funding platform, I think I leave it to the younger generations to, to figure out how we're going to use, make use of it. It's a beautiful concept to do that. It's the administrative and then business, it goes back to the business model. How would you make money out of it? Of course, from the exchange again, this is the best feeder for me. I mean. Any of, the, any of my team who's doing listing, this is, there's no better feeder funds for us than having TENS equity crowdfunding portal because you will eventually feed and exit on the exchange. Again, we are still monopoly in terms of the exchange, so I think I can say that for the time being. So uh, from, from the previous session, we talk about the regulation and we have uh, comments a lot on the funding portal, the duties of, on it. And for the investor and the offerer, we also have the regulation for the limit, limitation of the offering and limitation for invest. Uh, do you have any idea that uh, if we have a cap for the investment limit for each investor is it is it good or in the at at the first place i think that to limit the risk for each people and if we limit a small amount so there will be a lot of a lot of investor as you are scary of so this one is should be balanced well right and what what should we start, in your opinion, or uh, the regulation that we play, we we give in place is quite okay? Yeah, I, I think uh, still. Well, first of all, I um, I think it's important to understand the the the, the basics, as you said, as understand the business if business really works. Uh, instead of just going out there and testing it from their equity crowdfunding 
mechanism. And I also believe that I think there is a uh, um, definitely a trust crisis of a crowdfunding um, equity crowdfunding um, um, issue, and that needs to be resolved. Especially that's where the government agency can play an important role. But how do you find a um, a balance between the ease of the regulation as well as the efficiency of market and how to create a most beneficial environment for entrepreneurs and make sure that the mechanism is liquid and is, is flexible enough that it can be repeated and can be uh, uh, duplicated. I think that's, that's Im Im important. And, and I think um, Taiwan, uh, again, I think it's struggling to help its entrepreneur to tap into global market. Because if you look at the population of Taiwan, it's 23 million. Obviously, it's bigger than Singapore. But I think, uh, th Singapore is always thinking about Southeast Asia as the whole region. But our entrepreneurs is traditionally very, very much focused on local market or China market. But they have no advantage in China because everything that they, they do, it's quickly copied and quickly um, stolen in, in, in China. Um, but how do we use equity crowdfunding so that it would be the first step and have a good mechanism of institutional investors or uh, Series A um, uh, VCs light up after equity crowdfunding, have a good phase one and phase two mechanism to ensure that equity crowdfunding isn't the, the dead end you know, or isn't the only resort when it comes to um, um, uh, putting it out there for the general public to, to support. So the, the, the design of the package is, is very important and I think that's that's what most government agencies are struggling with, including um, what Taiwan is, is facing. And SEC uh, in Taiwan is constantly uh, engaging entrepreneurs to understand what we need, but I think we still got a bit of um, um, distance to go before we can actually roll it out. Yeah. Uh, So, uh, for the last question, we uh, heard about that the, the, the ASEAN will be opened by the end of this year. So, do you have any idea that uh, the crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding will be an opportunity for the ASEAN or Asia country? Do you see any opportunity for it, for equity crowdfunding? Um, you know, I'm listening to this conversation and I'm becoming cognizant of the fact that we're trying to figure out a model here. We're trying to figure out a model that works in the various localized environments, uh, regardless of whether they're dealing with a local market or dealing with international market. Um, I tend to like to look at things from an overarching standpoint and look for larger patterns because that tends to give a very good sense as to what's likely to happen. So if you'll indulge me for a little bit, uh, there, are th there, are th there are two things that have completely reshaped how we live our lives. Number one, the internet, undoubtedly. Number two, social media. And then we'll come to crowdfunding as a, a third mechanism. So let's take a look at the nature of the internet for a second. And hopefully you find your own peace in this, in this analogy. The internet was created by DARPA, an American defense agency, just in case there was mutually assured destruction between the Russians and the US, there was some line of communication that was open. So Tim Berners-Lee sets up the internet on an Apple computer and is designed as such. Even if a part of it collapses, the whole of it doesn't collapse. Now, a telco can go down, but the internet doesn't go down. It starts off as a closed community, it's turned into a global community, and there are, I think, 70% of people who, in the world today who are not even on board the internet at the moment. It's a self-adjusting mechanism. Now, when the internet was first created, government doesn't hop on board to it. You've got individuals who are tinkering, early adopters who are hopping on board. 
uh, then you've got small startup enterprises who hop on board. The first time I heard of the internet from a, like a, in a close proximity was a friend coming back from New York to Singapore and saying he just set up a website. I asked him, what do you need a website for? First of all, what is a website? What do you need a website for? And he says, I've put down the university I was in, the projects I did in university. He basically put on an online resume that became his website. Organizations were not creating websites. They come much later. Now let's take a look at the second analogy, social media. When social media is first created, it's again university-based, it's people with not a lot to lose. They're putting up photographs of being drunk at parties and a whole bunch of other things that may come back and haunt them thereafter, but they, it's democratization, they really don't care. Then social media starts to become pervasive and organizations start to figure out, how do I capitalize upon this because the fish are there. As a fisherman, that's where I need to go to. I personally find it quite disturbing that governments all around the world have set up Facebook pages, brought their entire citizenry on board, and are having public conversations. But the bottom line is, it's inevitable. They had no choice in the matter. Same thing with blogging for that matter. Individuals who are blogging, corporations don't blog. Why would I want to tell the whole world what am I doing? I want to keep things confidential. And then um, Business Week ran an article about Fortune 500 companies blogging. So the pattern is very clear. Individuals get into it, early adopters, small startups get into it, slowly over time it finds its particular ground, then the bigger boys want to get into the mechanism. And I think it's going to be the exact same trend with crowdfunding. It's been around since 2006. Equity crowdfunding has been around since 2007. Everybody's attempting to find a particular model. People are attempting to regulate. Uh, I think over time, a model will find itself and most likely the model will not be found by a regulator. It'll, there'll be multiple models going on out there and then regulation will come in there after. So maybe on the other side of it is, it's good to have an analogy of, maybe I put my toe in and get my toe wet, I don't jump into the pool wholesale yet. Because somebody somewhere is going to figure out a series of varied models that subsequently will be adopted. So I think the innovation is not going to come from regulators. Uh, regulators will have to step in thereafter, uh, in all likelihood. But that's just my point of view on this. The country will be in trouble once in innovations come from regulators. <laughs> we are not supposed to be known for our innovative. <laughs> not supposed to, but we are sometimes. But just to give you an idea on the ASEAN opening up, I mean, people look for the particular date. I mean, the exchange has been working for the last three, four years, already link up the system. I mean, the, link, the system is already linked up between Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand for the last three years, the SEX, the SET, and the Bursa. But you notice no much trade because people still localize. So that will give you some idea of what the equity crowdfunding would, might be. Because if you look at the, the trade, because my pitch used to be that if you don't like to, uh, you can invest in the same particular sector, but you can diversify your portfolios. Of course, I, I use this all the time until my ex-boss become the, the CEO of that particular company. For example, if you don't like Thai International, you can go Singapore Airlines. Sorry, boss. My ex-boss my, my, my ex now, the president of the, the Thai International. If you don't like Thai International, you can go for Singapore Airlines. But that's the concept of what diversifications and the, why the, all the exchange are all linked up. You, can't, you want to invest in the, the oil, oil company, now that oil price is not so good, you, could, you come to PDT in Thailand. You don't, because the natural petronas is not listed in Malaysia. So there are all kinds of diversification and that has been our attempt, really attempt to, to get investors to start thinking on a regional basis. It's a work in progress. Of course, crowdfund, equity crowdfunding could come from nowhere and, and shoot that, that because, because why? Because our investor profile are not the one who use the internet. Our main investors are still very much not social media and not much internet because they are still managing the traditional fund management. But in times, it will be. But just to give you an idea of the, the ASEAN experiment, the ASEAN exchange, you know what the, the, the stock that the Thai investors like to invest the most abroad? It's Thai Bave. Our company that are listed on Singapore 
So we actually list, we act, our Thai investors buy most is Thai Bay. Of course, I'm not particular, um, saying anything. It's just to give you an idea. Okay? So cross-border trade is still going to be, so if with the AEC, the ASEAN's opening up, for me, it's still very much in the local environment. Of course, now, if our local um, rules and regulations come out and, and, and the business model works and benefits everyone, that's even better for the local entrepreneurship. Why? Because it creates jobs. At the end of the day, for us, we, we look at all the numbers, it's the jobs. I had my team went out and, and look at the numbers. Ten years ago, how many jobs were there for all the listed company on the, on the second board? Less than 5,000. Last year, we went through the numbers, it's over 40,000. So that's how much jobs has been created, and that's what's good for the local economy. Same as equity crowdfunding, it will create jobs, and that's what's good for us. So I, for me, you know, even though I have my two sides of the coins, I still very much would love to see this happen. Time for any questions? What? Is there any question from the floor? Actually, I have two questions. Um, Jason, <coughs> you said, if I understand a couple of times, that uh, companies you've known that have done the equity crowdfunding have uh, sort of regretted it. Could you be a little bit more elaborate on in what way they've regretted it? Um, yeah, I, I, it was actually a very um, hasty experiment that, that's sort of uh, uh, promoted by OTC and because the thing is the maximum amount allowed to invest in the new startup for equity crowdfunding is only 2,000 US dollars and say I'm raising two million dollars and it, which means I, I, I have to have a thousand investors and each of them is equal weight and so that's the part I think that failed the system because it's try it try to make everyone equal from an investor's perspective. And I know the companies that are uh, dealt with this program, they've only raised a very small amount of money so that it's controllable and the people that they raise money from are friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually for the sake of uh, trying it out to make sure it, it can create some publicity and a, and a public image. Um, but I think for any company that's raising sizable amount, I think that method is, is not working. Um, I don't know if that answers your question here. Yeah. Well, not exactly. I mean, it sounds like you're saying, you're saying two reasons. One is that they weren't successful in getting much money, and the other is that the ones who did get much money had too many investors, but it sounds like that's something that could be handled by a proper investor agreement. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be true? I mean, you know, admittedly having to, you know, a thousand people who have different ideas uh, is going to be a problem, but, you know, if you set up an investor, agree and a, an investor agreement that handles that, it should be manageable. Or am I wrong? Am I naive? Yeah, you're right. But I think that the, the reason why that didn't happen is, is because um, they didn't foresee that so many people would participate in it. And actually, 20 companies that are um, trying to do the equity crowdfunding trial program I think uh, half of them failed, didn't raise enough of equity crowdfunding um, um, capital that they needed for various reasons, yeah. Okay, thank you. My second question, actually not directly crowdfunding, but given the makeup of the people on the stage, I really cannot resist um, asking what will be the relationship or impact, if any, of ASEAN on the Thai Foreign Business Act? Can you elaborate more? 
You mean well, on the, the Foreign Shared Business Act at the moment limits uh, foreigners' participation in companies in Thailand, right? Um, and will ASEAN citizens still be considered foreigners? Will there be a different category oh. for them? Will it change it at all? I don't think so. I think it's still being discussed, the originations of the, of the person. I think that was one of the issue, one of the trade issues still being discussed. Because the, you can camouflage from, you can come, the issue is how do, to, how do we prevent companies camouflage themselves as local even though they're not local? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that issue is still being discussed and still, I, I just had that thick, thick documents on what the, all the ASEAN um, countries signed on mm -hmm. and still on the definitions of the local juristic person still being discussed. Okay, thank you. My question also goes to Jason. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, there's growth in equity crowdfunding in, in, tai in Taiwan last year, and you also mentioned that one of the key success factors in, 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 in equity crowdfunding is regulation. Could you probably elaborate more, you know, how crowdfunding is regulated, you know, in, in the case of Taiwan, and including, you know, the regulatory environment? Yeah, so, so I think the, the trial program, um, I think from the government's uh, standard uh, failed uh, because 20 companies uh, listed it trying to raise equity crowdfunding, but I think 10 of them did not reach the goal they, they set up. Um, and, and I think there's been a lot of discussion on why that, they fail, the program didn't carry out enough of momentum. Um, I think one of them is there is a uh, market size of the particular business that this company is trying to raise the money from. Um, you know, if they focus on um, Taiwan market, it's too small for any sizable investors to be interested in. And also the maximum amount of equity investments allowed for this program is minimum only two thousand dollars it's more of like a sponsor from your family friends you know so that they own a stake of your company it's more of a, like a gesture or a symbolic sort of um, um, gesture that people can invest or the public can invest in a startup and um, it wasn't successful because it wasn't communicated communicated and articulated well to the public as to why it is important for companies to do equity crowdfunding. And, and I think after that, there's been a lot of discussions how something like this can be corrected. So I think I, I, I mentioned it earlier that there needs to be a second or third phases um, uh, in place when equity crowdfunding is, is uh, rolled out so that you, know, you won't have a you know, huge investor just eat it up, you know, and, and quickly grab it from the market for, um, versus the public that, who are interested in their project. But I think it's important for entrepreneur to understand why they wanna do equity crowdfunding. It's, I don't think it's not for every single project to go out and raise equity from the, the crowd. But it's interested to see the topic and the category that the business is in. If it has social impact, I believe that a lot of the social enterprises are a um, perfect fit for equity crowdfunding because you allow your businesses to be participated by the general public. And I think that's essential. The Taiwan government is trying to move forward with that is to promote social enterprise-based equity crowdfunding. And, and um, I think that would be a good angle to kind of go into, yeah. Any more questions? So, 
thank you for all panelists today. We have we have a lot of uh, anchor views and opinion from you, and we think that this session will be benefit for our audience and especially regulators that we can adopt and we can apply it to our regulation frameworks. Thank you very much. Please join me to give a big applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.